I'd like to welcome you. It's good to see your faces. It blesses me. And welcome those who are at home uh, live streaming. We miss you greatly. A special welcome to any first-time guests here this morning or on the live stream. Well, we're, uh, we're vis- if you're visiting, we're going through Romans. So I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 3. A few weeks ago, we finished a long section, 118 to chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul is showing the guilt and the condemnation of all of mankind, whether you're moral or immoral, we all stand guilty before this God, because all have sinned and come short of His glory. None can measure up to the righteousness that God requires to be in His favorable presence. It's a very hopeless section because it's designed to take away all hope in humanity, being able to fix our problem, to shut our mouths, to silence us before God. And so our world today is trying to fix our problems, and they're doing a really bad job. And this morning, I get to tell you a better remedy, a remedy that actually fixes hearts and hatred and problems and guilt and condemnation before God. So in Romans 3.21, we began of my favorite words that are going to be etched in my heart forever, but now. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so there's a new righteousness now that's been revealed in history. And we're going to spend several weeks looking at it to understand it. It's the best news in the world for all peoples, for every tongue, tribe, and nation. So this morning, we're going to take up this word righteousness. It's an interesting word in our day and age. What comes to mind when you hear it? In the world, it, it's a very negative term today. It's, it's like connected with self-righteousness. It's not a popular term. And we're going to look at what it means today in the Greek. But if I had to try to give you maybe a contemporary definition I came across in my study this week, it would be this. A validating performance record which opens doors. So to try to help you understand maybe the example of a resume. A resume is a record of all of your accomplishments when you're trying to get a job and you take it to a prospective employer and you give it to them and you say, I'm worthy of this position, accept me. And if if it's worthy enough, the door opens and you get the job. It's not surprising that every religion does the same thing with God. Some of you sitting here this morning are doing the exact same thing. Here's my moral record. Here's my religious accomplishments. My acts of service. It's how I get accepted with God. In Romans 2, we saw that the Jews said we, we keep the commandments. We do it. We're circumcised. We're accepted with God. The church is just jammed full of people who are sitting in it trying to get a religious moral resume to get accepted by God so the door will open to Him. I have better news for you, but now. There's a new way to approach God that's being manifested. Apart from the works of the law, apart from you trying to perform and get God to open the door. It's not just God giving you a good record. But what we're seeing, it's a divine righteousness, a God kind of righteousness that's being revealed and it's being put to your account by faith. It's a gift that comes to us. We we receive it with an empty hand. We don't bring our resume to God. We come with nothing. Empty. Bankrupt. and, And it opens the door. The righteousness that God will give to us in Christ. And that's what we'll look at today is this word, Justification. Justification, one of the most important terms in the Bible. So revolutionary to our time. We don't offer to God our righteousness for acceptance. He offers us to His to us for full acceptance. And so this is the opposite of every religion. It's the opposite of every philosophy and every heart, every human nature. This gospel is the opposite. It's contrary to everything. You can sit in a church that preaches it every week or you can sit in a parking lot and you can run it through your righteousness grid. And you keep hearing, I've had people here for 18 years that will finally come and say, why didn't you say it was by grace through faith? 
18 years. I'm like, I don't know. And, and this lady went back and listened to old sermons and said, wait a minute, you've been saying it all the, all the time. And so you can sit here, even this morning, and hear this and stick it in your, right, your, your own righteousness grid and not get the gospel. I just got to go work harder. I got to be a better Christian. I got to go prove my worth to get the door to open. You just, every Sunday you come and add to your list of what you got to go do to, to get God's acceptance. I heard an example this week of a movie maker who was very famous. I won't say his name, <clears throat> but he was getting older and he, he began to get very sick because he, he was working so hard and he just couldn't quit working. And in the article, they interviewed him and he said, I can't justify my existence if I quit making films. He said, every picture that I make, I earn my stay for another year. And so many people think this way and you don't even realize it. I'm always working to try to justify my existence and my being. Maybe as a Father's Day, parents, I have kids. Now I'm worthwhile. I'm valid. I have a reason for existence and it's to raise these children. It's for, your, it's for my justification. And something goes wrong with your kids and you're undone. Because your justification was in your children. I watch it daily. Every human being is trying to justify their being here. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm moral. I'm better. Living going on in our world, I'm better than that. I don't have prejudice. I, I'm not fighting the police. I've got a good attitude. I'm just a good person. My job that I do helps people. I'm a crossing guard. You know how many kids would get hurt? If I wasn't there, my dog needs me. Everyone is trying to justify themselves. And this morning, my goal is to show you what you're really looking for, what religion and morality has not brought you to, why you're still sad and insecure and trying to justify yourself. So I want to give you a quick preview and we'll pray and begin. Free justification is going to be offered to you this morning. The Greek word to justify meant to declare not guilty. It's, it's courtroom language. It's God of the universe saying to human beings, you're not guilty. And I'm going to flesh that out this morning. Justification is, is pardon, but it's more than pardon. It's not just, I'm forgiven. Thank you, God. My sins are forgiven. The liability I owed in punishment to God has been paid in full in Christ. But it's way more. This is so important that you get this because it's positive as well. It's the bestowal of a status and all the benefits that come thereof. Child of God and everything that comes by being that. One theologian put it well, it's, it's not you can go now, there's no punishment, but you may come and enjoy all of my love and acceptance with God. It opens doors. It brings you into the very presence of God. Forgiveness is pardon and it gets you out of jail. But there's also a status and justification that is placed upon you. Of all that Jesus did and all that he accomplished is put to your account. And you enjoy all the benefits thereof that come from the status the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your account this morning. Jesus was treated as if He did all that we did, all of our sin. And now we can be treated as if we've done all that He has done in righteousness. So that this morning, hear this, you could sit here as loved and accepted as Jesus is to His Father if you would dare to believe that. I could be as accepted as Jesus Christ is to His Father this very moment. Unbelievable gift. What's before you this morning is amazing. Justification. The merit of another. Gaining you full access and privilege into the love of God. To His table. To be a child of the King. And that will set you free from the bondage of a life of self-justification trying to prove yourself to God and to other people and the, the emptiness that will only end in condemnation when you stand before God. 
And so I ask, would you like that freedom this morning? Because the other, it's just a weight and a bondage. And this gospel is to set you free from that horrible life of trying to self-justify. So let's go to our God and ask Him to do what no human being could do this morning. Father, we come to You humbly. It's the only way to come to the God of the universe. We come humbly, marveling at justification. That has opened doors that we can come now into Your presence, accepted, loved, declared not guilty, the declaration of child of God on our heads. Lord, I pray for any who just have spent their life in self-justification. They sit here today still trying to vindicate themselves by what they do. Oh God, let the Gospel break in. There are believers who are confused on this that need help this morning. There are unbelievers who need to be saved and set free that your, your light would break into their dungeon this morning. And so God, I ask now that You would just attend this Word and Your Spirit would, would just illuminate open minds. Let every heart be set free in this truth. God, let us revel in this Gospel. Please do what no human can do. We need You to work on our hearts this morning and reveal because our, our flesh fights this. God, meet us. And be the center of all and be worshipped here this morning at Southside Bible Church. Amen. Our outline, we're looking at Romans 3, 21 through 31. We're looking at the eight elements of the righteousness that God gives to the believer. <coughs> Last week, we saw it's a righteousness that's been revealed. We live in a day and age when it's been revealed apart from the law. It's been revealed in Jesus Christ. In verse 22, our second point is it's a righteousness that comes by faith. It's not by your working. It's not by your improving or your doing. It's, it's by faith and believe what God has done in His Son. And then thirdly, we saw it's a righteousness that's necessary for all. Jew, Gentile, the whole world. It's a gospel that could save any who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no distinctions. It's glorious. And fourthly, this morning... And we're going to be in this, I'm sorry, for a little while, three weeks, month. Uh, the righteousness that makes us acceptable to God. So I think we should park on that because this is how we can be made right with God. And so in verse 24 is where we left off. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. My first question is how does this connect to verses 21 to 23, and it's important because righteousness is revealed apart from the law, and yet it was promised by the law and the prophets that this righteousness would come. So it's, it's not by the law doing, and yet the law and the prophets told us this is what was coming. It's a righteousness given freely to us that causes us to be declared by God, you're righteous, justified. And so I love it, being justified. That's what we all want, right? That's what we must understand and get. That's my goal this morning then. And so what I want to do is I want to start with what it's not, and then I want to park on what it is, and then we'll make some application. So first, what it's not. <coughs> Justification is not a moral transformation. Justification, it's a courtroom term. It's a legal declaration by the judge. You are not guilty but you're righteous. You're, you're actually righteous. You're, you're, you have the righteousness that God requires to be with Him. Perfect. So justification, I want you to hear this, is not regeneration. And what regeneration is, is that new birth. Nicodemus, you, unless you're born again, you want into the kingdom of God. And that's on the inside where God begins to work and He'll move it to the outside, which is going to be Romans 6 and following. It's not the infusion of righteousness or grace. It's, it's not righteousness being infused into my being. He doesn't pour righteousness down my throat and now I'm infused. And it's also not the impart, impartation of righteousness to me. It's not internal and intrinsic. It's not inside of me. He's doing things inside of me for sure that we will keep studying. But justification is on the basis of which God accepts me. So then what is it? 
Let's look at it. It's the opposite of the lead legal verdict we heard of condemnation in verses chapters 1-3. through three. You come into the world guilty. God's judgment is upon us and we spent three chapters looking at our guilt. So God's declaration of condemnation for that last day judgment He told us about, the verdict is you're guilty and you're going to be cast out into eternal lake. Did the verdict make you guilty? No, all it is, it's a declaration. And so the gospel, last day judgment, there's a verdict that says guilty, you're unrighteous. And now there's a verdict when you stand before God that says not guilty, you're righteous. On the last day, you're not guilty. And what's crazy is this is in the present tense. The verdict is right now for the believer. It's not just a judgment day. It's you could sit here this morning justified by God Himself. Not going and working and improving, trying to get God to justify you. If you could believe in Jesus Christ this morning, justified continuously now until the last day, we stand accepted and right and beloved by God. That is right now my verdict before God. Do you believe that? Let that burn into your hearts. God's looking at you saying justified. Secondly, it's a legal declaration before God that He receives me as righteous. I'm forgiven of all my sins and I get His righteousness. It it opens the door to God. and Full reconciliation. Full forgiveness. Full acceptance. All the rights and privileges of a son and daughter, legal declaration before the only one that matters, God. Thirdly, it's a righteousness which God imputes. A Greek word, logizomai. To credit someone's account. To legally put this into your account. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is logizomai. It's put into your account. Your, your name, Ken Murphy, has a righteousness of Jesus Christ put in my ledger, put into my account. Unbelievable. And fourthly, it's a legal declaration based on, it's called double imputation, and I'll explain that word. So you got a ledger, accountants, T account. you got a ledger with a list of all your sins. Every wrong word, attitude, thought, action that lacked the glory of God, Every failure to do what God requires to love Him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors, yourself. How much is that? For me, it would be a thousand semi-trailers hauling all up for me. But now, God takes all of those charges, all of those charges, and He takes them and He, he charges them to His Son. He, he imputes them to His Son. And Jesus is put on a cross and He bore the wrath of God in His body for our iniquities. That ledger, all of my sins, not in part but the whole, are nailed to the tree and I bear it no more. They're put there. And now when God looks at my ledger, what does He see in the sin account? None. Gone. I remember it no more. I buried it in the deepest ocean. How blessed is the man, it says in Romans 4 in our next chapter, that the Lord does not lo my his sin to his account. You know why you're blessed? All of my sin isn't going to be put to my account. Blessed is the man or woman or child who the Lord does not impute his sins to his account. What a blessing this morning, and they're not in my account. Any longer, they're gone. Paid in full, you owe nothing for your sin. The debt's gone. Far as the east is from the west, your sins have been removed. How do you walk around moping? (laughs) It's gone. Forgiven. And then there's another ledger. A ledger that lists all your acts of obedience to God. True righteousness, what God requires of you, right? motive and right action and your little ledger has a little post-it note not 10,000 trucks hauling all your sin but a little post-it note and you know what it says on that note filthy rags nothing 
There's none righteous, not even one. I just walk up to God thinking it's just so full. You're going to stand before Him and it's just going to have nothing but filthy rags before God. And here's your problem. God requires perpetual obedience. Perfect, perpetual obedience. Still trying? Still trying to get that done? None will ever be justified by the works of the law. So justification is now revealed that God will take Christ's perfect, perpetual obedience and impute it to your account. He will put that righteousness to your account. So when God looks at you right now, legally, positionally, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your account. So that all that God requires of me is provided for me in His Son, Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And fifthly, justification is a legal declaration by God, but it's also a declaration, and I want to use this term because it's, it's what the theologians use, it's called constituted righteousness. A constituted righteousness. Let me try to explain Romans 5.16, the first and second Adams. By the obedience of the one Jesus, the many, the translation will, is constituted righteous. The many will be constituted righteous. And so what does that mean? Well, <coughs> it's hard to explain, so I'm, I'm going to try. So let's say, I don't even know if he's here, Jordan. He is here. Where is he? Hey, Jordan, good to see you, bro. Let's just say he's a terrible criminal. Hard to picture. He's the bad man. I'm a judge. And Jordan's brought before me with a bad list of crimes. It's a long list. I say, okay, now I'm going to punish Joshua instead. I'm going to treat Joshua as if he was Jordan. What would you say to that? There's just something profoundly unjust about justifying the guilty, isn't there? In the book of Judges, if one of them justified the guilty, they were to be taken down and no longer be judges. You can't just declare it. Hey, I'm going to treat Josh as if he was Jordan. And you're like, that's just not fair. You can't do that. You, can't, you, you need real righteousness to be declared. This can't be legal fiction. You can't just be, okay, I'm going to treat you as you're righteous. The answer is union with Jesus Christ in the gospel, and in union with Him, you're declared righteous by imputed righteousness, and we are truly righteous. Union with Christ, all that is His, is mine by faith alone. Stunning. <laughs> Let me try again. Some of you look dazed. I can see, thank you for sitting a little closer. I don't even feel like I need to yell as much. The further away, I felt like I was in a stadium and had to scream, but you just feel like I could reach out and touch you this morning. It feels good. So here's my other example. Imagine that I'm a multimillionaire. I said, imagine. And I meet this sweet girl, and let's say her name is Laura, and she's just poor as a church mouse, can't rub two nickels together. And we just kind of hit it off. And I say, hey, will, will you marry me? And she says, of course I'll marry you. You're a millionaire. And we get married, and I now pronounce you husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, and we sign a marriage license. Drake and Mac, if you can picture this. And now Laura becomes a millionaire. Did she earn it? No, I did. Is she wealthy, or is it legal fiction? By union, what I really have is really hers. She can go to the bank and start drawing and using it. Guys, by faith, we're married to Christ. We're joined to Him. And what He has becomes mine. I was an undone sinner and guilty with no righteousness. And He takes me in a marriage, a union, and His righteousness is now mine. It's, it's real. I have all that Christ is to me. I have constituted righteousness. It's not fiction. And so when I stand before God now on the last day, to give an accounting of my life, 
Where's your righteousness? I'm going to point to Jesus and say, right there. All that you require, Father, I have in Him. We're one. We're union. We're married. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we sang this morning, when He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen? <clears throat> One of my mentors tells a story to help us capture this point. He was watching a detective show. and There was an old man in it. He was in his 80s. And he's this broken down ex-Marine. And he's been charged with a crime while he was in duty. And the military police have been searching for him and they, they finally tracked him down. And they pull up with all their jeeps and sirens and the big marine police guys get out of their cars. And they come and they put, they put the guy in handcuffs and they read him his rights and they're ready to take him into custody. And in the scuffle while they were trying to get it all done, the, the man's shirt was pulled open a little bit and now they could see what was underneath his tie and his shirt while this man was on the field in the battle in World War II for his bravery, he had received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And he said the military police, they instantly stop and they snap to attention and they salute him. And they take the handcuffs off. Why? They're honoring the medal because it represents all the people that had shed their blood and battle over all the decades of our nation for our freedom. Because again, our freedom was not free. And our spiritual freedom was not free. It cost God much, as we will see next time we're together. But that medal represented all the honor and glory, and they were saluting it. And I want you to think about this. Christ went into battle. He went up a cross on Calvary's hill with all the shame, mocked, stripped, naked, beaten, ridiculed. He went outside the gate, the garbage dump, Golgotha, all the shame that we deserve for our sin, he bore. And he had all the honors. He was raised to the right hand of God. The Son of God did not think equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. The honor that this one deserves is more than anyone ever has deserved. And his medal from the battlefield where he shed his blood to purchase us, his medal that purchased our freedom, the gospel of Jesus Christ is believe and his righteousness and his honor is pinned on you. He was treated as you deserved and now you're tr being treated as he deserves. Full pardon, full acceptance and honor and full reward to come into the fellowship of the Trinity. A medal is put on you, you're declared righteous, and Jesus Christ's righteousness and stand before Him. Richard Hooker, the Puritan, said, let it, let it be counted as folly, frenzy, or fury as whatsoever. This is our comfort and wisdom, and we care for no knowledge than this, that God has been made our sin that we might be made His righteousness. We are in the sight of God the Father, as is His very Son Himself. Do you believe that? This is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And I'll tell you this, I would do anything to have that kind of a gospel. I would pay any price. God name it. I would do any act. I would go anywhere you call me, God. Just send me. Just tell me what to do. And if you look at our text, being justified, what I just declared to you as a gift. This justification is given to us freely. It comes to us without any payment. Without any of our blood, sweat, and tears. Without our repentings and penance without our prayers and our self-denials. It's a 
the same word as it said they treated Jesus shamefully. It said without cause. They, they were treating him shamefully and there was no cause to treat him that way. And the same word is there, there's nothing in you to have cause God to treat you this way. It's free. There's nothing in you to cause God to do this. Revelation 21, 6. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Isaiah, God says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Trying to self-justify. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. I so desire this freedom for every one of you this morning. It's not the works of the law. It's not cleaning yourself up. It's not some of Christ and a little bit of you. It's not taking steps in religion. It's not how much you can grow. It's not how useful you are to the kingdom of God. It's not how far you've come or how you appear to others. It's not how many Christian books you've read or how many Christian artists you listen to. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no respite know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. I bring nothing to this courtroom but all of my sin and righteousness that's a filthy rag before God. That's all I can muster up. And in the next chapter it says God justifies the ungodly. That's the only thing I can do. The only thing I can be. Empty-handed with faith to receive the gift of God in Christ Jesus. Being justified as a gift by His grace. little redundancy, huh? What blessed redundancy. Being justified freely by His grace. Because mankind hates what you can't earn. We want to stay in control. We want to be God. We want to make Him a debtor. I want, I, want him, I want Him to owe. He owes me. This Gospel is all of grace. The heart of Gospel is the heart of God stretched out. If I could ask for one thing this morning, it would be, oh God, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Don't go back to Moses. Don't. It's apart from the works of the law. If I had anything that I've done, I'd disgrace grace. It'll no longer amaze you if you add anything else to this. This gift freely by God's grace. And this, get this, this, is something, this isn't something that God just gives to people. Here's a package of grace. Here's your little gift. Here's your package. This is God. It's, it's His attribute. His attribute is grace. He is grace. Grace is not a thing not something outside of God. It's not external to His being. God's grace flows out of the center of His being, His heart, His attribute. God is gracious. And He gives us a free gift where grace is He did all the work. That imputation is Christ did it all. God came into the world and He did everything necessary for your salvation. Are you trying to give God something still? Or has your heart been overtaken and suffocated by the ocean of God's grace to me and His Son? Free justification. Is your relationship with God this morning legal? Or is it gracious? What's your standing before God? Is it all of grace and you just sit here marveling? Amazing grace? Out of His fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. Moses came, but grace and truth were realized in Christ. 
I pray for salvation and for freedom for all of you this morning to receive the free grace and gift of God and His Son. As we close, I'm going to make a few thoughts. I just want to talk to the one who just keeps cycling in and out of churches, in and out of living for God, go to camp, renew, recommit, drift. Just Your whole life has just been that. My sins are forgiven, now I want to live for Him. And you just keep cycling in and out. In and out. You try hard to live godly, you, you'll post it on social media, those little things. You'll send this out if you really are bold for Jesus. If you don't, you're a coward and you had the courage and you sent that thing out. You fail, you fade away, you come back again. Try to live a good life. Come back, fail. Is that your life? Because you never get this. You're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you have received pardon for your sin. But you have an invitation into the banquet hall of God's deep, deep love and acceptance. I see more people live outside of that and wonder why they can't get anywhere in their Christian life. And so I want you to see your sins being forgiven. I can never uh, use hyperbole with how beautiful that is. But that brought you something with justification to enter into the fullness of God's love and acceptance, not your performance to get that. You have as much of the heart of God now as you will for all of eternity, and you have it all. You have it all. Come to an all-you-can-eat buffet the rest of your days and come feed and live off this God. I have union with Jesus Christ. and I just want to feed and live into this full gospel that God has given to me. I just meet more people in the church that stay at a distance from Jesus Christ. And you're just morally and you're, you're trying to self-justify and you just can't get anywhere because you just won't believe the gospel. And He's inviting you, I, I don't know how to say it more, freely, by grace. It's all done. Redemption of Jesus Christ, propitiation, all that we'll look at. Enter in. And quit thinking, I just got to improve. I got to do more so I can get into the inner circle. You can't be any more in the inner circle in the Trinity than when you believe in Jesus Christ. And, and by not getting that, it's hurting you. and You're, you're just not making progress. And so I want you to really analyze and do some heart surgery this morning. Is this gospel filled in my heart? Or did I go back to Moses? It's easy to go back to Moses. And I want you to stay in Jesus Christ and all the beauty thereof. Second, what are you looking for? What are you looking at for your justification? Are you looking at your morality? Is maybe just your whole goal is how people view you. I just want to be somebody. I want to be accepted. I, need, I want a place where they're always glad I came. My career, I'm just on this path that if I really do it well, then I am somebody. That'll make me something. My kids, if they can just do better than I did, then I am somebody. Then my life mattered. My own standard. I can't even live up to my own standard, but I just feel like if I do, then I'm going to be accepted. Maybe some accomplishment that you're working at to earn your right to exist for another year. Maybe you're just looking at how bad you are. All you can do is stare at yourself. I'm just so bad. I can't be justified. My Bible knowledge. I've seen more people make doctrine what justifies them. I know so much. (laughs) Do you know Christ? And is He changing you and transforming you? I don't care if your doctrine's getting better. I care if you're getting better by the grace of God. And so it's easy to self-justify by Bible knowledge. A validating performance record which opens doors. What are you looking at? Is that in your life this morning? 
Would you this day look to Christ alone for His record to be forgiven and have that medal pinned on you and the doors of paradise would swing wide open, justified, accepted, freely, by grace. And then, it is Father's Day, right? I love fathers. I love mine. Dad, if you're watching, I love you. I can't thank you enough for what you did in my life. But fathers, here's your calling. Let this take over your heart. You'll, net, you'll be a flop as a pop if you don't get this. Because if your kids are your self-justification, you're going to live, your old joy is going to rise or fall with them. Whatever they do or become, it's going it's to own you. It's going to control you all of your life. You'll never be a good dad until you're free. I'm loved by God. I'm justified. And now I'm just free to pour into these children and let God do His thing. And, and I'm praying and I want to see them love Him and walk with Him. But I'll tell you my, that my joy is not that. I love my children, but my joy is that I'm justified freely by His grace. So dads, show your family that the best life is someone who knows Jesus Christ in a vital union with change and transformation. I, I, I hate going to funerals when we sit there and say, I don't know. I don't know where they're at right now. And there's families sobbing and they can't find comfort because they don't know. Dads, let them know. Let them gather around your casket and say, my dad is in the presence of Jesus Christ, I have no doubt. Give them that gift. If I could charge you on Father's Day, be a dad like that who gets this gospel and lives it and just keeps showing them again and again. What a gift as a dad. Let this aroma fill your house, not Mount Sinai. I don't want your home to smell like Moses. I can walk in and smell it. Whew. It's awful. It's terrible. And it's just all these rules with harshness and you blow them and I'm just always pounding you and it just smells like Moses. Let your homes smell like Mount Sinai. Let them smell the aroma of Jesus Christ. Let, let, it, let it go. and just You walk in and you see people who know and love Christ and are gracious in their dealings with their children. So lead your children to this. Not trying to, to justify themselves with this world and earn their right to exist because every kid is trying to do this, whether it be their grades, their sports, their friends. They're all trying to self-justify. And our calling as parents is to show them that's a void and it's empty and it will never lead to the fullness of what I have in Jesus Christ. So I pray as parents, as fathers, uh, that we will get this. And I got a long quote by Spurgeon. I'm going to save it for another time. It's beautiful. You would have loved it. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer and then we'll have our song and a baptism. Father, let these words be taken into the mind and be understood. But God, don't let them stay there. Let every heart be full of affection right now for Jesus Christ and every will desirous of walking in Your footsteps. God, free grace makes us want to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to You. And so I pray, God, if there are any in here who still are stuck looking to Christ plus, looking to their performance for their acceptance, that this would be the day of their visitation. God, open eyes. Unstop ears. The, that, that righteousness grid that every time they hear a message, God, it just, it's self-justifying. Break it. Break in this morning. Let them see what they're doing and let them gaze into the face of Jesus Christ for free justification by grace. A double imputation, God. Our sins removed and Your righteousness placed. And therefore, we have peace with our God. Lord, let us live into this. 
Let, it, let us manifest the glorious righteousness that flows from free righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. God, I pray for our dads. I pray, Lord, help them to not be distant fathers. Lord, help them to be engaged. Help them to want to bring this glorious gospel into the minds and hearts of their children. Give them wisdom how to do that. There are times where it's simpler and there's times of of teenage years where it's more difficult. And so God, we need your grace to lead and guide us to know how to have this aroma in our home, to know how to, how to stand against sin, and point it to Christ for healing, for the glory and beauty of this gospel. So Lord, we are just a needy people. Help us to not spend our days beating each other up, but to love one another. Lord, let us help each other on this road to glory, that we unify on this amazing message and that we will give our lives to proclaim it. Lord, let us hold tightly to this beautiful, sweet gospel and now do your work in every heart for what they need here this morning. I I just have this vision. I desire to see everyone who's self-justifying that the gospel would break every idol that they're looking at this morning for their vindication. God, let them look only to Christ and be glad and be filled, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.